Welcome back to the workshop for another day of working on the Shamshir scimitar. In this episode, we're going to get cracking with the incredibly detailed gold inlay design that needs to go on this guard. This episode is brought to you with the sponsorship of NordVPN, and you can get a huge discount off a two-year plan as well as four additional months for free at nordvpn.com forward slash forge. Right, after four hours of kicking, threatening, and a few tears. We got our design printed onto a piece of paper. And what I also did is I printed out a few scaling options for the actual finished size of the design. And they look miniature. I can't believe how tiny this design is. This is microscopic in scale, which is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it means we've got to put less gold in it, so that's less actual time putting inlay in. But on the other hand, it means that we have to be so much more precise with the engraving that's required, the placement of the gemstones, and the placement of the gold. Too small, too small, still too small. Oh, a little too big, a little too small. Oh, what you reckon about that, Jamie? Just right. Yeah, I think that's about perfect. So in order for us to cut and engrave this design in, we're gonna need a good workspace for it. And it being summertime means that I wanna profit from the beautiful natural light coming into this workshop. And so what we're gonna do, Jamie, is we're gonna take all of this, and we're gonna shove it into the workshop, and we'll be engraving there. I present to you my updated jewelry studio, and it's looking quite nice. Come have a look over here. Jamie's design sense really kicked in here as we have some beautiful fire brick stands for the engraver and the micromotor. And I've super glued on some MDF spacers to get my turntable mounted. We're about ready to do some very mediocre engraving. But in order to engrave a design that is complex like this, we need to find a way of getting the design onto the workpiece. Now there do exist methods for transferring printed designs onto steel. On Steve Lindsay's website, he has a whole bunch of different methods for transferring from printed paper, depending on the printer that you have. So what I'm gonna now do is experiment and see what works for us. Ah, it didn't work. It worked a little. Not good. No way! It's working! Ah! That's cool. Ah! It doesn't stay on the base metal. There's a layer of the paper still there. And if the layer of paper is still there, it stays. Ah! But it comes off. Better than the last one. Still not there. Interestingly, non-stick baking paper does not stick to paper. <laughs> With spray. <laughs> this is specifically non-stick, it's silicon coated. is a mediocre transfer for a mediocre amateur engraver. So now it is on to a test piece. Here's the technique we've got. On Steve Lindsay's website, it's Laser Method D by Roderick Stannard, and it goes like this. First, the piece is degreased. Then, on silicon-coated non-stick baking paper, a laser printer is used to print your design. Top tip, I super glued it to some normal paper so it would feed. Then, a Demar varnish and Zippo fluid solution is recommended. I had neither, so I used yacht varnish and dirty petrol from my failed scooter. They're mixed together and then lightly applied. It's left to dry until it's tacky, then once tacky, ink side down, it's on with our baking paper, it's stuck on and rubbed first with the finger, and then with a the burnisher, and hopefully it stays put on the workpiece. Ha! <laughs> so now, having not done any engraving in, oh my goodness, 
over two years, perhaps? We've got to try and jump back in. So this is the system that we have. We have a pneumatic engraving handpiece, and we've got to find the right cutter. So here's what we've got. A very small high-speed steel flat engraver, a slightly larger carbide one, a carbide on glet, a carbide 120 degree graver, and a carbide 90 degree graver. For the length of this project, please remember this caveat. Every time I talk about engraving, I know nothing. I'm a complete rank awful amateur, but an engraving tool has these key geometries. It has a face angle, which is the front face of the cutting tool, and then it has a heel angle, which is a very slight 10 to 15 degree relief on the underside of the tool, upon which the graver rides through the material. The angles of them both are extremely critical, and without having properly sharpened tools with the correct geometry, there's absolutely no way I'll be able to carve this design. So, properly sharpening those tools to the correct geometry is what I'm now going to be trying. Just a couple strokes here too. It's also been a while since we've set up the old microscope camera, so have a look at this. There's the graver we just sharpened, that's the face, that's the heel. Alright, let's get one cut in. Here we go! We're on the move! We're cutting steel, baby! Oh my goodness, it's so beautiful. I forgot how utterly enchanting watching steel being engraved was. My goodness. Oh, magical. First cut in a little while. Could be a lot better, but it also could be one heck of a lot worse. It's the end of the day for me, so let's see how we get on in the morning after a little more practice. I've worked away on the practice piece, working on just cutting some lines, making sure my cuts are consistent, they're not. Working on hollowing out some areas for the inlay and making sure that's neat, it's not. Making sure my inlay is gonna be ready to go, it's not. And so therefore, we're now ready to jump onto the final piece. I'm terrified. Time to get our design stuck on one of these sides. Golly, that's hard to line up. I mean, that's hard to line up. Ooh, that's scary. I had to shuffle it around a lot, and I don't know if it's gonna transfer. Ooh, yes! The way I used to work with a microscope, until I learned otherwise, is I would just move the microscope around to where I was. I would rotate my ball vise a little bit and move the microscope a little bit. Move it, move it, move it. Well, it's not the way to do it. A couple of years ago, I went and took a class from Gabriel Owens of the Jewelry Institute in Texas at the Texas School of Engraving, and it helped me understand the benefits of using one of these, which is a turntable and making sure that the microscope stays locked in one position. The turntable stays in one position. The microscope is brought right to the middle of the rotation of the turntable. It's locked down, and then your workpiece in a ball vise goes on top of the turntable. And now, say I was wanting to work right here at the point of our design, I can work on it, and it'll spin in the middle of my field of view through the microscope tubes. Meaning that no matter where you're working, you can spin your workpiece 360 degrees and it's gonna stay in view all the time. And it is so much better than trying to move the microscope. You move the vise instead. Step number one is gonna be trying to cut a nice, neat border around the outside. Ah! I'm already making bloody dog's breakfast of it. This workpiece has a downwards angle, and as I have my graver in the cut, in order to cut that angle, I've got to hold it too low, and I keep bumping onto this ball. So we are on cut number one of the day and already experiencing troubles. I have two options. I either cut downhill or we modify the angle and geometry of our graver. I think the easiest option is to cut downhill. I'm 
not very good at this. Let's play a game. Let's review my first four cuts. Judges, please prepare your scorecards. Cut number one. Looks like we've got a BMX pump track, rather difficult terrain, smooths off, and then ends rather nastily. On to cut two. If this were a downhill run, this one would be a solid blue, nice and bumpy. You'll need four wheel drive for this bad boy. And half millimeter gold sure as hell isn't gonna be fitting in there. Overall rating, two out of 10. Here's why making a nice line is difficult. We're cut with a triangular shaped tool. It's about a 120 degree angle. If this is the line that we're cutting, the width of the line and any variations are of course dependent on the depth up the engraver we are. And how far in the tool goes into the material is determined by the angle at which I am holding it. If I'm too far up, I'm gonna dip it down. If I'm too far down, I'm gonna pull it up. And that's why my lines are wiggly and wobbly, is because I do not have the experience, the practice, and the muscle memory yet to keep it in the perfect angle. And remember this, our guard has tapers in both directions. It's not even a flat bit of metal which means that we're needing to account for the ever-changing angle of the workpiece, continuously change our hand angle, and it's a lot. If you ever wonder why engraved works of art are expensive, it's because you need to spend a lot of time to get good at cutting small little lines with carbide gravers. I wanna make up some thinner flat gravers so I can go in these lines and clean them up. All of mine are too thick though, so we're gonna thin this down on the diamond hose. resting my eyeballs. It's interesting, it's very relaxing to engrave when it's going well. When it's not going well, it's very stressful. As you've seen, my border is all the way cut. We've got a flat channel made, and what I've now been doing is going in and undercutting it to prepare it for the gold inlay. It was this, then this, now this. When the gold goes in and is hammered upon, it will swell in, fill the undercuts, and be locked in place. Now, if you've watched the channel for any sort of a reasonable length of time, you'll have seen me do this before on the Viking sword. The key difference this time being we've got the pneumatic engraver, but it's all the same stuff for this simple channel. It's gonna get a lot more difficult to do the gold inlay as we get into these thick sections. Don't be deceived by these small little lines. Those small little lines will be cut into the gold after the fact. So it's gotta be a big, huge whack of gold that goes all the way across to there. And we're gonna be doing it with wire. It's gonna involve cold welding the gold wire together as it's inlaid. And it's gonna be freaking difficult. Now, a little bit earlier today, I practiced some of this wider space inlay, stacking the gold wire to make a little logo. It was also very rough, but it was also the sponsor of our video. This episode has been sponsored by NordVPN, which exists to help make a secure internet for you. It works like this. They've got over 5,400 servers spread all over the world, and they act as an intermediary between you and the websites you browse, encrypting the data that goes between you and them, meaning that your internet service provider, your country, or hackers trying to intercept can't get access to your data and see what you're browsing and the data you're sharing. They have a strict no logs policy. They're not collecting any of your data. They don't consider it's any of their business. And because they've got servers all over the world, you can make the websites that you browse think you're browsing from wherever you want. So if you want to stream content that's only available to people with an IP address in the United States, you can easily, with the click of a button, in the handy dandy app for iOS, Android, Mac, and PC, change to a United States server and enjoy all sorts of great content. They've got 24-7 customer service, a 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get started by getting a huge discount off a two-year plan at nordvpn.com forward slash forge. You'll also be getting an additional four months for free. Check them out. Thank you all for watching. Bye-bye.